uh, you bear with me if I don't uh, stand tall. I will try to sit tall. It is a great privilege and pleasure to be here. I, I thank you for your very gracious hospitality. This is my first visit to Ball State, and uh, I have certainly accumulated good memories today, and I will take them with me and hope to return. I want to talk to you about um, the land and about the sacred element, the sacred dimension of landscape. Where words touch the earth, there is the sacred. And the sacred is essentially a moral agent of healing. In the world of native peoples, that equation is at the very center of life, and it's that that I would like to talk about this evening. I have a friend who knows about that equation. His name is Jeremiah Eipen, and he is a poet, um, a reindeer herder, and a hunty man. One day I visited him in his camp north of Hanti Mansisk in western Siberia, just east of the Urals and just south of the Yamal Peninsula. He told me of the Hanti bear feast. This is what he said. The hunter brings the bear to the edge of the village in a sledge, and the people go out to welcome their wild guest. He is taken, that is the bear, he or she, Sometimes it's a female bear, in which case the ceremony lasts a day longer. He is taken to his own shum, or house. His overcoat is removed gently, and bright coins are placed at his eyes. One by one, the people kiss his face and bid him good evening. Then the first singer, who knows a hundred songs, approaches, and the hunter asks, where are you going? The singer replies, I'm going to the bear's house. And the hunter says, why, that is where I am going to. The singer begins to sing the hundred song. And like the hunty singer, I too make a song which touches the earth. First man, behold, the earth glitters with leaves, the sky glistens with rain, pollen is borne on winds that low and lean upon mountains, cedars blacken the slopes, and pines impend. One hundred centuries ago, there is a wide, irregular landscape in what is now northern New Mexico. The sun is dull, a dull white disk low in the south. It is a perfect mystery, the sun, a deity whose passage is inexorable and eternal. The gray sky is curdled and it bears very close upon the earth. A cold wind runs along the ground, dips and spins, flaking drift from a pond in the bottom of a ravine. Beyond the wind, the silence is acute. A man crouches in the ravine, in the darkness there, scarcely visible. He moves not a muscle. Only the wind lifts a lock of his hair and lays it back along his shoulder. He wears skins and carries a spear. These things in particular mark his human intelligence and distinguishes him as the lord of his world and his world is definitively this landscape. For him, the landscape is as elemental as the air he breathes. He has no existence beyond that landscape. There is a blowing, a rumble of breath deeper than the wind above him, where some of the hard clay of the earth is broken off and rolls down into the water. At the same time, there appears on the skyline a massive head, the massive head of a long-horned bison, and then the hump, and then the whole beast, huge and black on the sky, 
standing to a height of seven feet with horns that extend six feet across the shaggy crown. For a moment, it is poised there, and then it lumbers obliquely down the bank to the pond. Still, the man does not move, though the beast is now only a few steps upwind. There is no sign of what is about to happen. The beast meanders, the man is frozen in repose. Then, then the scene explodes. In one and the same instant, the man springs to his feet and bolts forward, his arm cocked and the spear held high. And the huge animal lunges in panic, bellowing in its whole weight thrown violently into the bank, its hooves churning and blasting clods of earth into the air, its eyes gone wide and white. There is a moment in which its frenzied motion is wasted, and it is fixed in the extreme realization of the hunt. And the man hurls the spear with his whole strength, and the point is driven into the deep vital flesh and the bison staggers and falls. This ancient drama of the hunt is enacted again and again in the landscape. The man is preeminently a predator, the most dangerous predator of all. He hunts in order to survive. His very existence is simply and squarely established upon the, that basis, but he hunts also because he can, because he has the disposition and the means. He has acquired the ultimate weapon of his age, and his prey is accessible to him. His relationship to the land has not yet become a moral equation. But surely in time, surely in time he will come to an understanding that there is an intimate, vital link between the earth and himself, a link that embodies an intricate network of rights and responsibilities. In some then unimaginable future, he will surely understand that he, and he alone, has the ability to devastate and perhaps destroy his environment. And surely that moment will be one of profound significance in his evolution. The weapon, the weapon he wields is deadly and efficient. The hunter has taken great care in its manufacture, especially in the shaping of the flint point, which is an extraordinary thing. A groove has been made on both surfaces of the head, a groove that extends from the base nearly to the tip several hundred pounds of pressure expertly applied were required to make these grooves. The hunter then is an artisan and he must know how to use rudimentary tools. His skill is unsurpassed in his time and place. By means of this weapon is the Paleo-Indian hunter supremely able to exploit his environment. Okay, that is one hunting scene that I wanted to share with you. Now, thousands of years later, about the time that Columbus begins his first voyage to the New World, another man in the region of the Great Lakes stands in the forest shade on the edge of a sunlit break. Nearby, a deer enters into a pool of light. Silently, the man fits an arrow to a bow, draws aim, and shoots. The arrow zips across the distance and strikes home. These two hunting scenes are similar, aren't they? But there is a crucial difference. The latter-day man is much more than a hunter and toolmaker. He is also a skilled fisherman, a husbandman, even a physician. 
and he is far more at home in his environment. He fells trees and builds canoes. He grows corn, squash, beans. He gathers fruits and nuts, and he uses hundreds of species of wild plants for food, medicine, teas, and dye. He has fitted himself far more efficiently into the pattern of the wilderness than did his ancient predecessor. He lives on the land, he takes his living from it, but he does not destroy it. This distinction supports the fundamental ethic that we know is conservation. In principle, if not yet in name, this man is a multiple use conservationist. These two illustrations of man in relation to the physical world are less important in themselves than is that long distance between them, that span in which something happened, something that brought about a kind of revolutionary um, construct of heritage, healing, and land. I believe that in that vague interval there grew up in the mind of man an idea of the land as sacred. At dawn, eagles high and hover above the plain where light gathers in pools, grasses shimmer and shine Shadows withdraw and lie away like smoke. How does such a construct emerge? Where does the process begin? Perhaps it begins with the recognition and acknowledgement of beauty. The simple realization that the world is beautiful. We don't know much about the prehistoric hunter's sensibility. It isn't likely that he had leisure in his life for the elaboration of aesthetic ideals. And yet, the weapon he made, the weapon he made was beautiful as well as functional. It has been suggested that much of the minute chipping along the edges of his spear point served no purpose but that of aesthetic satisfaction. A good deal more is known concerning the man of the central forests. He made beautiful boxes and dishes out of elm and birch bark. He, his canoes were marvelous, delicate works of art. And this aesthetic perception was a principal fact of his time and place, as indeed it is of our time. And place. The contemporary Native American is a person whose strong senses of symmetry, design, color, and composition are evident in his arts and crafts, in his religious ceremonies, and in the stories, songs, and prayers of his rich oral tradition. This, in view of the pressures that have been exerted upon the Indian world and the often ugly marks of civilization that have marred his, its landscape, is a blessing and an irony. There is a Navajo ceremonial song that celebrates the sounds that are made in the natural world, the particular voices that beautify the earth. Voice above voice of thunder speak from the dark of clouds voice below grasshopper voice speak from the green of plants so may the earth be beautiful there is in the motion and meaning of this song a comprehension of the world that is peculiarly native i believe that is integral in the Native American worldview. Consider, the singer stands at the center of the natural world, 
at the source of its sound, of its motion, of its spirit. Nothing of that world is inaccessible to him or lost upon him. His song is filled with reverence, with wonder and delight, and with confidence as well. He knows something about himself and about the things around him, and he knows that he knows. I am interested in what he sees and hears. I am interested in the range and force of his perception. At each level of his expression, there is an extension of his awareness across the whole landscape and deep beneath its surface. The voice above is the voice of thunder, and thunder rolls. Moreover, it issues from the impalpable dark clouds and runs upon their horizontal range. A sound that integrates the whole of the atmosphere. And even so, the voice below, the voice of the grasshopper, say, issues from the broad plain and multiplicity of plants, we are given in the song the wide angle of the singer's vision and the depth of his perception to the pulse of the earth itself. We are given the testament of his dignity, his trust, and his profound belief. This comprehension of the earth and air is surely a matter of morality. For it brings into account not only man's instinctive reaction to his environment, but the full realization of his humanity as well. The achievement of his intellectual and spiritual development as an individual and as a race. One afternoon, one afternoon several years ago, an old Kiowa woman, a kinswoman, talked to me telling me of the place in the Great Plains where she had lived for a hundred years. It was the place in which my grandparents, too, had lived, and theirs before them, and it is the place where I was born. And she told me of the times when dogs could talk, and the Kiowas came down from the north and centered their culture in the red earth of the southern plains. She told me wonderful stories. And as I listened, I began to feel more and more sure that her voice proceeded from the land itself. I asked her many questions about the Kiowas, for I wanted to understand all that I could of my heritage. I told her that I had come there to honor her and learn from her. And she said simply, it is good. It is good that you have come. I believe that she meant it was right, it was appropriate that I should pay respect to her age, to her long experience of the land. She had a great reverence for it, a reverence that is gained only in the course of generations and in the inheritance of blood memories that transcend generations. At noon, turtles enter slowly into the warm, dark loam. Bees hold the swarm. Meadows recede through plains of heat and pure distance. The process of investment in and appropriation of the spirit of the land is a function of the imagination, I believe. It involves an act of imagination that is moral in kind. We are what we imagine ourselves to be. The Native American is someone who thinks of himself, imagines himself in a particular way. I think it is an entitlement. The quality of this imagining is determined by cultural experience. Native attitudes towards the land have been formulated over a long period of time, a span that reaches back uh, to the end of the last ice age. The land, this land, is secure in the blood memory of the Native American. It is this ancient ethic 
of the native that must shape our efforts here and now to preserve the earth and the life upon and within it. At dusk, the gray foxes stiffen in cold. Blackbirds are fixed in white branches. Rivers flow. Follow, rivers follow the moonlight, the long white track of the full moon. The bear is our guest of honor, Yeremiah says, and we are guests too. The bear presides at his own feast and we are respectful. There is a balance, an appropriate understanding, you see. It is good and it is right that we should make this ceremony. It heals and strengthens our hearts. It gives us to know where we have come from and where we are going. It gives us to know who we are. There is a prayer in Navajo which brings these things together. That is the idea of beauty, the idea of origin, the healing nature of, of, of landscape, and the landscape itself. I would like to recite that uh, prayer to you. Thegi ye, which means place among the rocks, the place of origin. House made of dawn. House made of evening light. House made of dark clouds. House made of male rain. House made of dark mist. House made of female rain. House made of pollen. House made of grasshoppers. Dark cloud is at the door. The trail out of it is dark cloud. The zigzag lightning stands high upon it. Male deity, your offering I make. I have prepared a smoke for you. Restore my feet for me. Restore my legs for me. Restore my body for me. Restore my mind for me. Restore my voice for me. Your spell remove for me. This very day, take out your spell for me. You have taken it away for me. Far off it has gone. Happily, I recover. Happily, my interior becomes cool. Happily, I go forth. My interior feeling cool, may I walk. No longer sore, may I walk. With lively feeling, may I walk. As it used to be long ago, may I walk. Happily, may I walk. Happily with abundant dark clouds, may I walk. Happily with abundant showers, may I walk. Happily with abundant plants, may I walk. Happily on a trail of pollen, may I walk. Happily. May I walk. May it be beautiful before me. May it be beautiful behind me. May it be beautiful below me. May it be beautiful above me. May it be beautiful all around me. In beauty, it is finished. I have lived with that prayer for a long time, and it has never fail to bring me a kind of peace and tranquility, a kind of perspective upon the world that is very important to me, and I share it with you. I want to tell you a little bit more about that afternoon in Oklahoma when I talked to the old woman, Kosan, my, my kinswoman, um, I only met her one time, and I only spent one afternoon with her, but it was an unforgettable experience. Uh, I had been told that she was someone who knew about Kiowa history, Kiowa tradition. 
she had been to the Sundance as a young girl. The last Kiowa Sundance was held in 1887. She was there. There weren't many people living at that time who had been to the Sundance. She was one of them. And so I had, I thought, this wonderful opportunity to talk to her, to ask her questions, and to find out things that only she knew and could tell me. She was uh, very old. She was wizened and bent over upon herself. She was frail. She had white hair that was drawn back uh, and, and placed under a net. She wore the traditional dress of the Kiowa matron, a kind of long dress with full sleeves and an apron-like sash. Um, she had only one eye. I don't know what happened to the other eye. Her face was wrinkled, wonderful character in it, and she was lively. She was, uh, at a hundred years old, possessed of great vitality, and her memory was very strong. Well, my father and I invited her to my grandmother's house, to the arbor, which uh, is a kind of traditional structure uh, beside the main house. It's, it's a place where you live in the summer, in the summer heat of Oklahoma, because it is open on all sides to the breezes, and it's usually very comfortable. And so my father and I honored Kosan, the old woman, by inviting her there and preparing a banquet, a feast, which is the way the Kaiwas do it. We had good food, a lot of it. Various uh, people came, and uh, we did uh, honor to Kosan. And then it came time for me to ask her questions. And I was very excited because I had never had such an opportunity. I'd never met anyone who could tell me things about my heritage uh, to the extent that she could. And so this was a great opportunity for me. And um, she sat on a bench and, you know, folded over upon herself. And I thought, I'd better get to it because she's not going to last very long, you know. <laughs> I'm going to exhaust her very quickly, and then it's, it's going to be over. So I better take advantage of this opportunity. Grandmother, I said, what can you tell me about the Sundown? I know that you were there, the last Kaiwa Sundown. What do you remember about that? And she brought up her head and got this you know, wonderful look in her face. She screwed up her face in this wonderful scowl. And she said, oh, oh, don't ask about that. Don't ask about that. That is too far back. No one knows anything about that, grandson. And you know, I felt terrible then. I thought, what have I done? <laughs> but having made the protest, the protestation, she answered the question in minute detail. And she did that time and time again. I would ask her a question. And she, oh, don't ask about that. And then she would answer the question. So I realized... I realized after a time that, you know, I had happened upon a kind of formulaic expression in Kiowa. It was incumbent upon her for some reason to deny that she knew anything about it, and then she would answer the question. But um, this is what she said about the sundown. She said, oh, grandson, it was beautiful. It was beautiful. I was a young girl, and I had gone to sleep in, in our teepee. And in the morning, my sisters, my older sisters came and they, they, they woke me up and they said, come, come, come outside, you must see. And so, you know, very sleepy, I, I went out and the camp, the camp was so beautiful. Everyone had cleaned the, the, the teepee and there were 
pendants of colored ribbon everywhere flowing in the breeze and everybody was dressed in his and her finery it was just an incredible sight and I was I was excited and overjoyed to see so much color never seen anything so beautiful and then my sister said you must make an offering you must come to the Taime and make an offering the Taime is the Sundance fetish of the Kiowas it is the most powerful medicine in the tribe it's a medicine bundle and during the Sundance and then only was Taime exposed to view it was taken from its uh, its uh, bundle and and placed on the on the sacred tree in the Sundance Lodge and uh, she said to me she said I didn't I didn't have anything to offer I had nothing and I didn't know what to do one of my sisters gave me a piece of cloth a piece of red trade cloth and told me to place it on the tree and I did and I felt very good about having something you know to offer time and she said then they brought the buffalo they brought the buffalo the head of the bull buffalo the buffalo was the sacrificial victim of the Sundance and they had to kill a buffalo bull and impale its head on the on the tree in the Sundance Lodge and she said I saw them bring the buffalo in and I uh, it was it was a very powerful thing and then I saw the old woman approaching in the distance there was an old old woman she had something on her back this old woman and the boys and girls of the rabbit society the children's society ran out to see what it, to greet her and to see what it was she had on her back it was a bag full of sandy earth that is what they must have in the lodge the dancers must dance upon the sandy earth it had been brought down from the mountain the old woman held a digging tool in her hand and she held it up and she pointed to the east it was like a kiss she pointed with her lips it was like a kiss and she began to sing she sang now we have brought the earth now it is time to play as old as I am I still have the feeling of play that's how the Sundance began she said that's how it always began well I was listening to her talking about the Sundance and you know I was enthralled um, I was there you know with Kosan in the Oklahoma July she talked and she laughed easily um, I said at one point grandmother um, you know so many things you can tell me so many things yes she said I can tell you many many things um, later after I had been with her I I wrote the book that is called the way to rainy mountain which is a collection of Kiowa tales and in the epilogue of that book I write about Kosan and as I was writing it <coughs> one evening a strange thing happened I had written the greater part of the book all of it in fact except the epilogue I had set down the old Kiowa tales and I had composed uh, both the historical and the and the uh, personal reminiscences which became the the uh, um, accompaniment to the tales themselves I had written the two poems in which that book is framed and I had the sense of being out of breath you know of having said what it was in me to say on that subject but as I looked at the manuscript which lay before me in the bright light uh, small to be sure but complete or nearly so I had the sense that something was missing and so I went back through the pages backwards and forwards and uh, 
as I was as I was uh, thinking about it, um, suddenly the old woman Kosan stepped out of the language and stood before me on the page. I was amazed, of course, and yet it seemed to me entirely appropriate that this should happen. She looked at me and she said, yes, grandson, what is it? What do you want? Well, you know, I said, oh, oh, uh, grandmother, I said, oh, you know, I was just writing about you. Um, I thought that you, you were, you know, thought that you had, no, she said, she cackled and she said, you have imagined me well, grandson, and so I am. You have imagined that I dream, and so I do. I have seen the falling stars. Well, you know, I knew that she was referring to the falling stars of 1833, which was a crucial moment in the in the tradition of the Kiowas, in 1833, November 13, there was a display of meteors, Leonid meteors, over the Earth, and it was particularly visible over North America. And the Kiowas, who were camped in the Wichita Mountains, were awakened by the light of stars falling in the universe. Some were brighter than Venus. One was said to be as bright as the full moon. And so she said, I have seen the falling star. Um, yes, I said, interesting. Uh, that, you know, that, I didn't know that. I didn't know that you were there. And she said, oh, I was there in my mind's eye. I could see these things. And I said, um, you are, how old are you, grandmother? <laughs> and... Uh, you know, it seemed to me that I was being extremely rude, but I couldn't help myself. And anyway, she, she seemed to understand. She said, oh, grandson, I do not know. I think I'm a hundred years old. And I said, you have seen many things. And she said, yes, I imagine that I have grandson. You know, the Kiowas came into the world through a hollow log. And in my mind's eye, I have seen them emerge one by one from the mouth of that log. I have seen them so clearly how delighted they were to see the world around them. I must have been there. And I have seen antelope bounding in the tall grass near the Bighorn River. The Kiowas migrated from the Yellowstone region to the southern plains and so they lived uh, you know they they went down the rain shadow of the Rocky Mountains and they spent time in the Black Hills and, and uh, she said I've seen antelope bounding in the tall grass near the Bighorn River I've seen the ghost forests of the Black Hills I was with those who were camped in the Wichita Mountains when the stars fell but I said you have seen many things. Oh, yes, I imagine that I have, she said. And then she turned, nodded to me, and receded into the language I had made. And I imagined that I was in the room alone. Well, in such stories as that, does the oral tradition of the Native American exist? It is uh, secure, I think, in that tradition of storytelling. I love to tell stories. I love to hear stories told. In my teaching, I, um, I, have, uh, I have the opportunity to talk about that tradition, to compare it to the written tradition, and... Uh, it, you know, I'm here to tell you that the oral tradition is very much alive. It's very vital. 
over half the population of the world does without writing at this point. Now, I'm a writer, and so I can say nasty things about writing if I want to. I can say that writing gives us a false impression, a false security where language is concerned. We can write something down and put it uh, in a desk drawer, and we can be reasonably sure that it will be there when we come back for it. Um, we, we tend to take language for granted because of writing. In the oral tradition, it is otherwise. Um, everything is just one generation from extinction in the oral tradition. If something is not passed from one generation to another, it is lost. Um, and so in that tradition, which is the tradition of Homer, for goodness sake, of the Beowulf, uh, of some of the great stories and, and epic poems in, in literature. In that tradition, the speaker, the storyteller, must speak with great responsibility. He must be careful of what he says. The listener must hear, you know, clearly, accurately. And most important, he must remember what he hears. And that is the great vitality of, uh, of the oral tradition. Well, it may be that I have talked long enough, and uh, it is, uh, again, let me say, a wonderful privilege for me to be here and to talk to you about things that I love to talk about, uh, and I thank you for your attention, and I hope. Sure. Okay. I can't yeah. see hands, but I'll, maybe I'll they'll turn up the light. The front. Okay. Yeah. okay. Thank you. I have agreed to take some questions if you have them. Um, I can't see you. Okay. Oh, you know, you know, I, I asked her that. Uh, th there, was a, there was a point in our conversation when I said, oh, yes, yes, grandmother, of course, you know, but, but you, you were not really here. You were not really here in this room. And she looked at me and she said, be careful of your pronouncements, grandson. If I am not really here in this room, then neither are you. So yes, she was really there. <laughs> English. Uh, my, my father was a Kiowa full blood and he spoke Kiowa fluently. My mother was French, English, and Cherokee. So the language of my home was English. And uh, though I did pick up other languages along the way, smatterings, English was my first language and is the only language that I can pretend to have possession of. I think it is possible to honor the earth I think Native people have an intrinsic love and respect for the land. I think they have a lot to teach us about that. I'm talking, you know, if I can talk from the viewpoint for a moment of the European um, immigrant to the New World, um, it seems to me that Western civilization has a mistaken idea of, of, the, of the landscape, uh, has, a, has not an appreciation of its vitality and its spirit. We tend, uh, and I'm speaking from that point of view, we tend to think of the earth as dead matter. It exists for, you know, to be exploited. We, we are supposed in our way to, to uh, take from it uh, natural resources, things that um, improve our lifestyle. So we think, 
for the time being. We don't look uh, to future generations. Um, and we don't have, uh, we don't have, the, we don't recognize the vitality, the spiritual vitality of the earth. We do not pay it proper respect, and we are going to regret that, I think, in time. Perhaps we've already begun to regret it. But if we, if we take the Indian experience of the land, which is 30,000 years old at least, um, we can learn a great deal. We can benefit by the native example, and we can come much closer to a reverence for the earth, for the physical world, for nature. Uh, I'm very sanguine on that point. I believe that it can be done. I think many people are doing it. Many people are concerned uh, because we are in the process of destroying our planet. Um, that can all be turned around, I believe. I want to believe it, and I do. But it will take great effort on our part. It will take an act of the imagination probably larger than any we have exercised in our history. Can be done. I don't know that he's terribly important. Um, uh, we are, you know, of the human race. We, in this, in this uh, wonderful environment of the tent, we are all human animals. We have, we have uh, an idea of our importance, our superiority as a species. We think we are superior to the other creatures, the non-human species. And I'm not sure that that's right. I have a great uh, interest in parietal art, and I have been to some of the great prehistoric caves in Europe. And I've looked at those paintings, you know, on the walls, and they are wonderful, wonderful. And I think about man's relation to those animals 20, 30,000 years ago. And I wish that we could appropriate some of that respect, some of that reverence for, for the animals on the walls of the caves. You know, the painters thought of these animals as deities. Uh, they not only loved them, but they respected them, and they believed that they were of great supernatural power. Um, I have known animals. I have known of animals that I can feel that way about. I sp last year I spent uh, several months in Alaska, and I saw a kind of wildlife there that, you know, is, is wonderful. I studied something about the grizzlies up there, and um, John McPhee, who wrote uh, Coming Into the Country, a wonderful book about Alaska, made the point that when you go into grizzly country, you better understand that you are the grizzly's guest, you know. And you must think of these animals in that way. You are there at their behest and in the spirit of their generosity. The grizzly is superior to you and me physically, you know. You can't outrun them. You, you're the, your strength as compared to the strength of a grizzly is negligible. Uh, your sense of smell nothing to match the grizzly, the superior creature. And in, in those old times, you know, when, when people uh, had not our, our knowledge of technology and our so-called civilization, they recognized those characters, uh, the characteristics of those animals. They saw them for what they truly are. We have lost that. Uh, the Kaya would say when they want to indicate a time in the distant past, they say, oh yes, that happened when dogs could talk. And uh, I love that. I have a couple of dogs who can talk. <laughs> we have the most uh, wonderful conversations. They're mostly phil philosophical conversations. But, but uh, now and then we tell jokes, you know, and it's wonderful. But we, 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 most of us don't believe that... Uh, 
animals exist on the same plane with us. And that's our loss. That's a mistake. And it's our loss. So the, the short answer to your question is man plays a, a very significant role in, uh, in the world. He has, uh, you know, come to a, a, a stage of evolution that is truly remarkable. Language is certainly one of the things that uh, I'm interested in language, language in general. I like to think about how language started, the origins of language. Um, and I can talk at great length about that, and I do to my students. Um, but, but we, in, in, in the process, you know, have fooled ourselves in certain real ways. We, we're not really as, uh, as important and godlike as, as we often think we are. And it would do us good to go among the animals. Go grab a grizzly by the tail. <laughs> you, know, you, you, you can learn something. I heard a joke the other day, which I'm going to pass on to you because it's that time of the evening. I get silly as I go along. But um, I heard this story about a man who went into grizzly country and he found himself face to face with a grizzly and he didn't know what to do. And so he ran and the grizzly after him. And he came to a cliff, you know, just a, a, a rock wall. And he turned around and he dropped to his knees and he prayed. And he said, Lord, give this bear religion, please, you know. And the bear, who had stopped short when the man dropped to his knees, dropped to his knees, placed his hands together and said, Lord, thank you for this meal that I am about to enjoy. <laughs> <laughs> One more question. Sure. One more question. I I didn't hear all of that. Yes, I think that's important. Um I, ha I, can, I can talk about that for at some length, too, because I, I have been, uh, you know, I've been grappling with the problem of taking something from the oral tradition and putting it into the written tradition. Uh, there are certain things to say about that. Um, one, one of the things that you can say is that when you do make that transformation, there is a change. Something changes. Uh, something is lost in translation is another way to put it, and that's certainly true. But there is also such a thing as a good translation. And the, the, kind, of, um, the kind of translation that I think is, is really important is that which preserves the spirit of the original. And that's, that's, that can be done. We see that. We see that in, uh, in Homer. We see it in the Beowulf. The, these things, we can... We can read these things in English without losing the original spirit. And uh, that kind of translation is, is not only valuable, but it's necessary because that is the way that we can preserve, you know, oral tradition. And if we didn't do it, it would be lost. So I very much believe that it is necessary. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you very much.